Chapter 6 Monday morning, just before first period, I called school and asked for Miss Stevenson, but Miss Baxter, who answered the phone, said she was homesick. I thought for a minute, and then, because I didn't want to talk to Mrs. Poindexter, I asked for Miss Stevenson's home number. This is Liza Winthrop, I said uncomfortably. I guess you know I was suspended Friday. I, um, don't know if I'm supposed to do homework or how I'm supposed to keep up with classes or anything. There was a pause during which I imagined Miss Baxter taking out one of her lace handkerchiefs and dabbing mournfully at her eyes. Six, two, five, she said, as if she were praying. Eight, seven, one, four. Thank you. I clicked the receiver button and began dialing again. Miss Stevenson's phone rang five times, with no answer. I was just about to hang up and call Sally to see if by some chance she knew what we were supposed to do, when a voice, not Miss Stevenson's, answered. Um, I said eloquently, this, um, is Liza Winthrop, one of Miss Stevenson's students at Foster? Well, I'm sorry to bother her if she's not feeling well, but the thing is, oh, Liza, the voice said. This is Miss Woodmere. Isabel, I mean Miss Stevenson, has a terrible cold and I was just about to leave her school. Late, as you can see. Is there anything I can do? I remembered then that someone had once said they thought that Miss Stevenson and Miss Woodmere lived together. Or, Miss Woodmere was suggesting, would you rather talk to her directly? It's just that she feels very rotten. No, it's okay, I said quickly and explained. Ms. Woodmere left for a couple of minutes and then came back and said, yes, I did have to keep up and she'd send my homework to me via Chad if that was okay. And wasn't it nice it was a short week because of Thanksgiving? She suggested I get in touch with Sally to tell her it would be a good idea for her to make some kind of arrangement too. So I called Sally. She still sounded upset about everything and then I spent the next 20 minutes deciding what to wear to Annie's school. I must have put on four different pairs of jeans before I found one that wasn't dirty or torn or too shabby or not shabby enough, and then I darned a hole in the elbow of my favorite gray sweater, which I'd been putting off doing since spring. By the time I left, it was after 10 o'clock. It took me more than an hour to get to Annie's school, what with changing subways and all. She'd drawn me a rough floor plan of the building and copied down her schedule for me, but she'd also warned me I wouldn't be able to just walk in, as someone pretty much could at my school, and she couldn't have been more right about that. As soon as I saw the building, I remembered her comparing it to a prison. I've seen big, ugly schools all over New York, but this was the worst one of all. It was about as imaginative in design as a military bunker. I went up the huge concrete steps outside, through big, double doors that had wire mesh over their windows, as did the regular windows, and into a dark, cavernous hall with metal stairwells off it. The first thing that hit me was the smell. A combination of disinfectant, grass, and the subway on a hot day, with the last one of those the strongest. The second thing that hit me was how the prison atmosphere continued inside. Even the interior glass windows, on doors and looking into offices, were reinforced with wire mesh. And right in the middle of the hall, opposite the doors, was an enormous table with three security guards standing around it. The biggest of them stood up to me the minute I walked in. What do you want? he demanded belligerently. I told him my name, as Annie had warned me I'd have to, and said I was a friend of Annie's and had come to see the school. How come you're not in school yourself? he asked. I didn't know what to say to that. I thought of saying I was a dropout, or that my school had all week off for Thanksgiving, or that I'd graduated early, anything but that I'd been suspended. But then I figured I was in enough trouble already, and besides, I've always been a terrible liar, so I told the truth. He asked why I'd been suspended, so I told him that, too. And that did it. He and another guard herded me into a little office off the hall. 
Then he asked how I'd like it if they called Foster to verify my story. And the other guard asked if I'd mind emptying my pockets. And when I said, what for? He looked at his cohort and said, is this kid for real? Needless to say, I never did get any farther inside Annie's school that day. So I left and spent the next few hours at the Museum of the American Indian. When I got back, at about 2.30, the guards and a couple of cops were outside and what seemed like thousands of kids were pouring out the doors. And just as I was thinking there was no way Annie was going to find me except by luck, I spotted her and yelled, waving my arms. One of the guards started edging toward me, but I managed to duck out of his way and get lost in the crowd. Annie watched from the next to top step till I crossed the street, and then she came toward me, smiling. Let's get away from here, she said, and led me around the corner to a quiet little park where there were mothers and baby carriages and dogs. A different world. I tried to get in, I said, and explained. Oh, Liza, I'm sorry, she said when I was through. I should have warned you more. I'm sorry. Hey, it's okay. Those security guards are jerks, she said, still sounding upset. They probably thought you were selling. She gave an odd little half laugh and sat down on a bench. We could use fewer of them here at school and more where I live. I didn't think it was so bad, I said, remembering her embarrassment when we took her home. Where you live, I mean. I sat down next to her. Oh, come on, said Annie, exploding the way she had at the cloisters over the ear piercing. You know what goes on in those buildings, the ones no one lives in? Kids shoot up, drunks finish off their bottles and then throw up all over the sidewalk, muggers jump out at you? Sure, it's a wonderful neighborhood. I'm sorry, I said humbly. I guess I don't know much about it. That's okay, Annie said after a minute. But it didn't seem okay to me, because there we were, sitting moodily on a cold bench, saying I'm sorry to each other for things we couldn't help. Instead of being happy to see Annie, which I'd been at first, now I felt rotten, as if I'd said something so dumb the whole friendship was going to be over with when it had only just started. Feeny, end of script. Annie poked her foot at a bunch of dry cracked leaves near one end of the bench. We were sitting pretty far away from each other. Somewhere out there, she said softly, there's someplace right. There's gotta be. She turned to me, smiling and less upset, as if she'd forgiven me or maybe never even been as angry as she'd seemed. Where we lived when I was little, after we'd moved to San Francisco, you could see out over the bay. Little white specks of houses nestled in the hills like, like little white birds. Getting back there and finding out if it's as beautiful as I remember, that's one of my mountains. She flapped her arms in her coat. It was thicker than her cape. But I could see that it was old, even threadbare in spots. Sometimes then I used to pretend I was a bird too, like the ones I pretended were across the bay, and that I could fly over to where they were. And now, I said carefully, you're going to fly across the whole country to get to them. Oh, Liza, she said. Yes. Yes, except... But instead of finishing, she shook her head. And when I asked her, what? She jumped up and said, I know what let's do. Let's walk over to the IRT and go downtown and take the ferry back and forth to Staten Island till it gets dark so we can see the lights. Have you ever done that? It's neat. You can pretend you're on a real ship. Let's see. Where do you want to go? France, Spain, England, California, I said without thinking. I'd like to help you find your white birds. Annie put her head to one side, for a moment reminding me of the way she'd pretended to be a unicorn at the cloisters. Maybe there are white birds in Staten Island, she said softly. Then, I said, I guess we should go on a quest for white birds there. California's very far away. That's what I was thinking before. Annie said, we were walking now toward the subway, but next year's far away too. I wondered if it really was. On the subway, Annie's mood changed and mine did too. After we sat down, Annie whispered, have you ever stared at people's noses on the subway till they don't make sense anymore? I said I hadn't 
And then, of course, we both stared all the way to South Ferry till people began scowling at us and moving uncomfortably away. We rode back and forth on the Staten Island Ferry for the rest of the afternoon, sometimes pretending we were going through the Panama Canal to California after all, and sometimes pretending we were going to Greece, where I was going to show Annie the Parthenon and give her architecture lessons. Only if I can give you history ones, she said, even if they hardly teach it at all at my stupid school. How come you know so much then, I said, thinking of our improvisations. I read a lot, she said, and we both laughed. After about four trips back and forth, the ferry crew caught on that we'd only paid once, so the next time we pulled into St. George, Staten Island, we got off and hiked up one of the hilly streets that led away from the ferry slips, till we got to some houses with little yards in front of them. Annie said, serious again, I'd like to live in a house with a yard some day, wouldn't you? And I said, yes. And for a while we played a quiet, shy, too, game of which of the houses there we'd live in if we could. Then we sat down on a stone wall at the corner of someone's yard. It was beginning to get dark by then, and were silent for a while. We're in Richmond, Annie said suddenly, startling me. We're early settlers, and... Then she stopped, and I could feel, rather than see, that she was shaking her head. No, she said softly. No, I don't want to do that with you so much anymore. Do what? You know, unicorns, maidens and knights, staring at noses even. I don't want to pretend anymore. You make me want to be real. I was looking for some way to answer that when a woman came out of a house across the street, carrying a mesh shopping bag and leading a little dog on a leash. When she reached the corner, she put the shopping bag into the dog's mouth and said, Good pixie, good girl, carry the bag for mommy and we both burst into helpless laughter. When we stopped laughing, I said awkwardly, I'm glad you want to be real, but, well, please don't be too real. I mean, Annie gave me a funny look and said, Annie Kenyon's dull, huh? No, I protested. No, not dull at all. Annie Kenyon's what? Annie Kenyon's what? I wanted to say fascinating, because that's really what I was thinking but I was too embarrassed. Instead, I said, interesting, but then that sounded flat, and I knew Annie couldn't see my face clearly in the twilight anyway, so I added, fascinating, after all. I thought, magical, too, but I didn't say that, even though just sitting there in the growing darkness with Annie was so special and so unlike anything that had ever happened to me before that magical seemed like a good word for it, and for her. Oh, Liza, Annie said, in a way I was beginning to expect and hope for. Then she said, so are you. And I said stupidly, so am I what? Instead of answering, Annie pointed down the street to where Pixie and Mommy were coming back. Then, when I was looking at them, the streetlights were on now. Annie said very softly, fascinating. Pixie was still carrying the shopping bag, but now it had a head of lettuce in it. Pixie was so low to the ground that the bag was bumping along the sidewalk. I hope, Annie said, that Mommy's planning to wash that lettuce. We sat huddled together on the wall in the shadow of some big trees, watching until Pixie and Mommy were back inside their house, and then we walked back down to the ferry slip, shoulders touching. I think one reason why we didn't move away from each other was because if we had, that would have been an acknowledgement that we were touching in the first place. We each called home to say we'd be late, and on the way back in the ferry, we stood as far up in the bow as possible so we could watch the lights in Manhattan twinkling closer and closer as we approached. We were the only people on deck. It was getting very cold. Look, said Annie. She closed her hand on mine and pointed up with her other hand. The stars match the lights, Liza. Look. It was true. There were two golden lacework patterns now, one in the sky and one on shore, complementing each other. There's your world, Annie said softly, pointing to the Manhattan skyline, gold filigree in the distance. 
Real, but sometimes beautiful, I said, aware that I was liking Annie's hand touching mine, but not thinking beyond that. And that's like my world, Annie pointed up to the stars again. Inaccessible. Not, I said to her softly, to unicorns. Nothing's inaccessible to unicorns. Not even, not even white birds. Annie smiled as if more to herself than to me and looked toward Manhattan again, the wind from the fairy's motion blowing her hair around her face. And here we are, she said, Liza and Annie suspended in between. We stood there in the bow for the whole rest of the trip, watching the stars and the shore lights. And it was only when the ferry began to dock in Manhattan that we moved apart and dropped each other's hands. Chapter 7 Two days later, on Wednesday, Annie managed to get out of her school long enough at lunchtime to smuggle me into the cafeteria, a huge but shabby room as crowded as Penn Station or Grand Central at Christmas. While we were sitting there trying to hear what we were saying to each other, a tall, gangling kid unfolded himself from his chair, took at least a foot of heavy chain out of his pocket, and started whirling it around his head, yelling something nobody paid any attention to. In fact, no one paid any attention to the boy himself, either, except for a few people who moved out of range of the swinging chain. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe anyone would do that in the first place, and I also couldn't believe that if someone did, everyone would just ignore him. I guess I must have been staring, because Annie stopped in the middle of what she was saying and said, You're wondering why that guy is swinging that chain, right? Right, I said, trying to be as casual about it as she was. Nobody knows why he does it, but in a few minutes, one of the carpentry teachers will come along and take him away. There, see? A large man in what I guess was a shop apron came in, ducked under the flying chain, and grabbed the kid around the waist. Right away, the kid froze, and the chain went clattering to the floor. The man picked it up, stuffed it into his pocket, and led the kid out of the cafeteria. Annie, I said wildly, you mean he does that often? Why don't they take the chain away from him? I mean permanently. Why don't they... I don't know. You did mean he does it all the time, didn't you? Annie gave me a partly amused, partly sympathetic look and put down her chocolate milk carton. He does do it all the time, once a week or so. They do take the chain away from him, but I guess he has an endless supply. I don't know why they don't do anything else about him or for him, but they don't seem to. She smiled. You see why sometimes I prefer white birds? And unicorns and knights, I answered. Good Lord. When I first came here, Annie said, I used to go home and cry at night. But after about two months of being terrified and miserable, I found out that if you keep away from everyone, they keep away from you. The only reason I never try to transfer is because when my mother works late, I go home at lunch to check on Nana. I couldn't do that if I went to another school. There must be some okay kids here, I said, looking around. There are, but since I spent my whole freshman year staying away from everyone, by the time I was a sophomore, everyone else already had friends. She smiled wryly, criticizing herself. It isn't just that people in New York are unfriendly. It's also that I've been unfriendly to people in New York. Till now. I smiled at her. Till now, I repeated. After lunch, since I was going to meet Annie at her apartment late that afternoon, I went to the Guggenheim Museum and tried not to think too hard about what might be happening at her school while I was safely looking at paintings. But I kept thinking about it anyway, and about how depressing a lot of Annie's life seemed to be, and about how I wished there was something I could do to make it more cheerful. The day before, after Annie got out of school, we'd gone to the New York Botanical Garden, where I'd been a couple of times with my parents, and Annie went wild walking up and down greenhouse aisles, smelling the flowers, touching them, almost talking to them. I'd never seen her so excited. Oh, Liza, she'd said, I never even knew this place was here. Look, that's an orchid. Those are impatiens. That's a bromeliad. 
It's like a place we used to go to in California. It's so beautiful. Oh, why can't there be more flowers in New York? More green things. As soon as I remembered that, standing halfway up the spiral ramp that runs through the middle of the Guggenheim, I knew what I'd do. I'd buy Annie a plant and take it to her apartment as a sort of thank you present. Thank you for what? I didn't really know, but that didn't seem to matter much as I rushed back outside to find a florist. I found one that had some flowering plants in the window. Do they have these in California? I asked the man. Sure, sure, he said. We have them all over. That didn't tell me much, but I was too nervous to ask any more questions, even to ask what kind of plant the one I wanted was. It had thick furry leaves and was covered with light blue flowers. By then I knew that blue was Annie's favorite color, so I decided it probably wouldn't matter what kind of plant it was. The pot had hideous pink tin foil wrapped around it, but I took that off in the slow elevator in Annie's building and stuffed it into my pocket. I, I remembered to knock at Annie's door. She told me the buzzer didn't work, and in a few minutes, a quavery voice said, Who is it? Liza Winthrop, I said and then said it again, louder, because I heard something rattling under where the peephole was. When the door opened, I had to look down suddenly, because I'd been ready to say hello to someone at eye level. But the person who opened the door was a tiny, fragile-looking woman in a wheelchair. She had wonderful bright blue eyes and a little puckered mouth that somehow managed to look like Annie's, probably because of the smile. You must be Annie's friend. The woman beamed at me, and as soon as I heard her accent, I remembered that Annie's grandmother had been born in Italy. Sure enough, the woman said, I'm her nonna, her grandma. Come in, come in. Deftly, she maneuvered the wheelchair out of the doorway so I could step inside. Annie, she helped her mama make the Turk, Annie's grandmother said. It was a second or two before I realized that Turk was turkey, but the wonderful smell that struck me as soon as I was inside told me my guess was right. We make him the day before. It was one word, beautiful, day before. When she said it, it sounded like a song. So on Thanksgiving, we can have a good time. Come in, come in, Nanny. Your friend, she's here. What a pretty flower. African violet, no? I, I don't know, I said, bending a little closer so Annie's nana could see the plant's flowers. I don't know a thing about plants, but I just found out Annie likes them, so I brought her one. I'd never have dared admit to most people, most kids anyway, that I'd brought Annie a present, but this lovely old lady didn't seem to think there was anything odd about it. She clasped her gnarled hands together, and it was then that I knew where Annie had gotten her laugh as well as her smile, because her grandmother laughed in exactly the same way. Annie, she be very happy, Nana said, her bright eyes twinkling into mine. Very happy. You wait till you see her room. She loves flowers. Annie, look, she said, turning her head toward Annie, who had just come out of the kitchen, her hair braided and wrapped around her head, a dish towel around her middle, and her face red from the heat of the oven. Look, your friend. She brought you a friend. Nana and I chuckled at her joke as Annie looked at the violet and then at me. I don't believe this, Annie said, her eyes meeting mine above her grandmother's softly gleaming white hair. You brought me an African violet? I nodded. A happy Thanksgiving. Oh, God, Liza, I suppose you're going to tell me this is part of your real world, too, right? Well, I said, feigning modesty, it's real, all right. Real world, what you talk, said Nana. Annie, you push me in the kitchen so I can help your mama. Then you go with your friend and talk. Annie winked at me as she took the back of her grandmother's chair, and Nana reached out and squeezed my hand as Annie started to wheel her past me. I like you, Lies, she said, pronouncing my name the way Chad often did. You make my Annie happy. She's so sad sometimes. Nana made the corners of her mouth droop down like a tragedy mask. Ah, oh, young girls, they should laugh. Life's bad enough when you're grown. You might as well laugh when you're young. You teach my Annie that lies, okay? Okay, I said, looking at Annie. I think I held up my hand when I said it. You promise good, Annie. She's laughed more this week since she met you. Annie wheeled her grandmother into the kitchen 
and I stood awkwardly in the hall, looking down at stingy walls into the living room. I could see part of a very worn carpet that must once have been bright red, and a lopsided sofa with some stuffing working its way out around the edges of a couple of patches, and a faded photo of the Roman Colosseum hanging on the wall next to a cross with a dry palm leaf tucked behind it. Nanas, said Annie, coming back and pointing to the cross. The rest of us aren't very religious. My mother's Protestant, and I don't know what I am. She'd taken the towel from her waist, but her face was still red and a little shiny from the heat. A wisp of her hair had begun to come loose. I wanted to push it back for her. Nana adores you, she said. I adore her, I answered, as Annie led me through the living room and down a shorter but dingier hall to her room. Listen, I take it as a solemn pledge, I said, as Annie stepped aside in the doorway so I could go into the small room to make you laugh like she said, okay? Annie smiled, but a little distantly, sat down on the edge of her narrow bed and motioned to the only chair, which was at a table that was piled high with books and music scores and seemed to be working as a desk. Okay, she said. I like, I like your room, I told her, looking around and trying to keep away the awkwardness I was beginning to feel again. The room was tiny, but full of things that obviously meant a lot to Annie. Mostly the books and music scores, but also several stuffed animals. And, as Nana had said, plants, what seemed like hundreds of them. Because of them, you didn't even notice right away that the desk table was scarred and a bit rickety, that the bed was probably an old studio couch, and that one window had a piece of cloth stuffed in part of it, I assumed to keep out drafts. There was a big feathery fern hanging in the window and a pebble-lined tray with lots of little plants on the sill. On the floor at the foot of the bed was a plant so huge it looked like a young tree. Oh, come on, Annie said. It's nothing like your room. Your room looks shiny and, I don't know, new. Her eyes followed mine to the huge plant near the bed. That's just a rubber tree from Woolworths. I got it when it was little. Only 95 cents worth of little. Well, it must be a hundred dollars worth of big now. Hey, I mean it. I like your room. I like your grandmother. I like you. For a minute, neither of us said anything. Annie looked at the floor and then went over to the rubber tree and flicked something invisible off one of its leaves. I like you too, Liza, she said carefully. She had put the African... Violet on the desk table, but now she picked it up and took it over to the window sill, where she made room for it on top of the pebbles. Humidity, she said. They like that, and the pebbles help. I mean, the water you put in the tray for it helps. Oh, damn. She turned away from me suddenly, but something in her voice made me grab her hand and pull her around to face me again. To my astonishment, I saw that she was nearly in tears. What's the matter, I asked, standing up a little scared. What's the matter? Did I do something? She shook her head, and then she rested it for a second on my shoulder. But when my hand was still on its way up to comfort her, she moved away and went to her bedside table, where she fished a Kleenex out of a box and blew her nose. Yes, you did something, you jerk, she said, sitting on the edge of the bed again. You brought me a present, and I'm such a sentimental fool. It's making me cry, and I'm upset because I don't have any money to get you a present but I wish I did. Oh, for God's sake, I said, and I went over and sat next to her and put my arm around her for a second. Look, I don't want you to give me a present. That's not what this is about, is it? I, I don't know, Annie said. I never really had a friend before. That's what I was sort of trying to tell you today in the cafeteria. Well, I did in California, but I was a lot younger then, even if I did think I was going to die when she moved away. We were both in sixth grade then. You're the jerk, I said. Presents aren't part of it, okay? I just knew you liked flowers, that's all. And that was exciting to me because I never knew anyone who did, and I can't make anything grow to save my life. Maybe it's a thank you present for showing me Staten Island and... and everything. Annie sniffed loudly and finally smiled. Okay, but that's not what this is about either, is it? Thank you, presents. That's no good. Right. I got up and went back to the chair. Tell me about your friend in California, if you want. 
Yes, said Annie, I think I do. For the next hour or so, I sat there in Annie's room while she showed me pictures of a pasty-faced, dull-looking little girl named Beverly and told me about how they used to go for walks on the beach and pretend they were running away and how they used to sleep over at each other's houses, usually in the same bed, and how they giggled and talked all night and sometimes kissed each other, the way little girls sometimes do, Annie said, reddening. I knew Annie had been pretty young then, so I didn't think anything of it. And then I asked her about her grandmother, who turned out to have made all of Annie's clothes till her fingers got too stiff from arthritis. Annie said she sometimes listened to Nana breathe at night for fear she was going to die suddenly. After a while, Annie and I went into the kitchen, where there were several cats milling around in that sideways way cats have. We sat at a round table with orange plastic place mats on it and sniffed the roasting turkey and talked to Annie's mother, who was mousy and tired-looking but nice, and to Nana, who didn't seem to me to be anywhere near dying. We drank grape juice and ate a whole plate of some wonderful Italian cookies filled with figs and dates and raisins. When I left, Nana made me take a bag full of cookies home to Chad. The next day, Thanksgiving afternoon, the doorbell rang just as I'd finished my second piece of pumpkin pie while Dad was telling the same story he told every year about when he and his brother swiped a Thanksgiving turkey and tried to cook it over an open fire in the woods in Maine where he grew up. I pushed the buzzer and ran down to see who it was, and it was Annie with a short, stocky man with a black mustache who turned out to be her father. There was a yellow cab double parked in the street. Annie looked as if she'd rather be on another planet. Mr. Kenyon took off his little squashed cap and said, We don't mean to interrupt, but Annie, she says she come down to see you this afternoon, and I say Thanksgiving is a family day, and maybe you don't want company, and she say maybe I don't want her to go, so I bring her down. You gave her such a nice present. I thought maybe you and your mama and papa and your brother might like to come for a ride with us in the cab. That way, all the families stay together and can get to know each other, too. I looked dubiously out at the double-parked cab, and then I saw Nana's cheerful face in the window behind a fluttery wave. We always take my mama for a ride in the cab on holidays, explained Mr. Kenyon. I could tell from Annie's face that she was absolutely perishing with embarrassment, and I tried to signal her that it was okay, because it was. I could understand how she felt, but I thought her family was terrific. Let me go ask, I said, and ran upstairs. Annie came after me and grabbed me on the first landing. Liza, I'm sorry, she said. He he doesn't understand this country. I don't know. He's been here since he was 20, but he still thinks he's back in some Sicilian village, and I like him, I shouted, shaking her. I told you I like your grandmother and the cats in your kitchen and your mother, even though I don't know her very well, and I like your plants and your room and you, except when you're a jerk to be so worried that I'm not going to like whatever. Annie smiled sheepishly and leaned against the wall. I think it's jerky, too, she said. I mean of me. It's just that, well, I'm always worried that people are going to laugh at them. Well, I'm not going to laugh at them, I said. And if you are, I'll go live with them. And you can come here and live in stuffy old Brooklyn Heights and go to Foster Academy and almost get expelled for piercing ears. And Annie, I said, as soon as it struck me, are you jealous? Is that what this is really about? Do you envy me? No, said Annie softly. Then she laughed a little. No, I don't. Not at all. You're right that I don't like the school I go to or the neighborhood I live in. But no, I wouldn't want to to swap with you or anything. She smiled. I guess you made me realize that just now, didn't you? Well, good, I said, still angry. Because if you do want to swap, if that's all I mean to you, forget it. I surprised myself. I was so mad. 
Oh, Liza, no, Annie said. No, that's not what you mean to me. It's not like that at all. Not at all. She edged away from the wall and then faced me, dropping a quick curtsy. Will the Princess Eliza please to come for a ride in the magic wagon of the humble peasant? We will show her wonders. Gypsies, seagulls, shining caves, the Triborough Bridge. Oh, you nut, I said, reaching for her hand. You unicorn. For a minute, we stood there looking at each other, knowing with relief that it was all right again between us. Dad and Mom and Chad decided to stay home, though they came downstairs at my insistence to meet Mr. and Mrs. Kenyon and Nana. I think I was trying to prove to Annie that they wouldn't laugh at her family either. Good old Chad. When he and Mom and Dad were going back in and Annie and I were standing by the door, he turned to Annie and said, Your dad's neat, Annie. What a neat cab. I could have kissed him. We drove all through Brooklyn and up into Queens that afternoon, and then back down through Central Park. And the whole time, Mr. Kenyon and his mother told stories about Italy, and Mrs. Kenyon laughed and prompted them. Mr. Kenyon's father, who had died in California, had been a butcher in his village in Sicily, and cats used to follow him all over because he fed them scraps. That was why the Kenyons still had cats. Mr. Kenyon said life just didn't seem right without a cat or two around. Chad was right that he was neat. I can't really remember what Annie and I did during the next couple of days of vacation. Walked a lot. The village, Chinatown, places like that. It's Sunday that's important to remember. It's Sunday that I've been thinking around the edges of. Had you ever felt really close to someone? So close that you can't understand why you and the other person have two separate bodies, two separate skins? I think it was Sunday when that feeling began. We'd been riding around on the subway, talking when it wasn't too noisy, and had ended up at Coney Island. It was so late in the season that it was deserted and very cold. We looked at all the closed-for-winter rides, and at a few straggling booth owners who were putting battered pastel-painted boards up over their popcorn or dime toss or win-a-doll stands, and we bought hot dogs at Nathan's. There were only a couple of grubby old men eating there, I guess because most people don't have room, even for Nathan's the weekend after Thanksgiving. Then we walked on the empty beach and joked about hiking all around the edge of Brooklyn up into Queens. We did manage to get pretty far, actually, at least well away from the deserted booths, and we found an old pier sort of thing with a lot of rotting brown pilings holding back some rocks. I guess it was more or less a breakwater, and we sat down close together because it was so cold. I remember that for a while there was a seagull wheeling around above our heads, squawking, but then it flew off toward Sheep's Head Bay. I'm not sure why we were so quiet, except that we knew school would start again for both of us the next day, and we wouldn't be able to meet so often or so easily. I had my senior project, and student council if I was re-elected, and Annie had to rehearse for her recital. But we'd already worked out which days during the week we'd be able to see each other, and of course there would still be weekends, so maybe that wasn't why we were so quiet after all. Mostly it was the closeness. It made my throat ache, wanting to speak of it. I remember we were both watching the sun slowly go down over one end of the beach, making the sky to the west pink and yellow. I remember the water lapping gently against the pilings and the shore, and a candy wrapper, three musketeers, I think, blowing along the beach. Annie shivered. Without thinking, I put my arm across her shoulders to warm her, and then before either of us knew what was happening, our arms were around each other and Annie's soft and gentle mouth was kissing mine. When we did realize what was happening, we pulled away from each other, and Annie looked out over the water, and I looked at the candy wrapper. It had gotten beyond the pilings by then, and was caught against a rock. For something to do, I walked over and stuffed it into my pocket, and then I stayed there, looking out over the water, too, trying to keep my mind blank. I remember wishing the wind would literally blow through me, 
cold and pure and biting. Liza, Annie called in a quiet voice. Liza, please come back. Part of me didn't want to, but part of me did, and that part won. Annie was digging a little hole in one crumbling piling with her fingernail. You'll break your nail, I said, and she looked up at me and smiled. Her eyes were soft and troubled and a little scared, but her mouth went on smiling, and then the wind blew her hair in wisps across my face, and I had to move away. She put her hand on mine, barely touching it. It's all right with me, she whispered, if it is with you. I, I don't know, I said. It was like a war inside me. I couldn't even recognize all the sides. There was one that said, no, this is wrong. You know it's wrong and bad and sinful. And there was another that said, nothing has ever felt so right and natural and true and good. And another that said it was happening too fast. And another that just wanted to stop thinking altogether and fling my arms around Annie and hold her forever. There were other sides too, but I couldn't sort them out. Liza, Annie was saying, Liza, I, I've wondered. I mean, I wondered if this might be happening, didn't you? I shook my head, but somewhere inside I knew I had at least been confused. Annie pulled her collar up around her throat, and I wanted to touch her skin where the collar met it. It was as if I had always wanted to touch her there, but hadn't known it. It's my fault, Annie said softly. I, I've thought sometimes, even before I met you, I mean, that I might be gay. She said the word gay easily as if it were familiar to her, used that way. No, I managed to say, no, it's not anyone's fault. I know that underneath my numbness, I felt it made sense about me too, but I couldn't think about it or concentrate on it, not then. Annie turned around and looked at me, and the sadness in her eyes made me want to put my arms around her. I'll go, Liza, she said, standing up. I, I don't want to hurt you. I don't think you want this, so I have hurt you, and oh, God, Liza, she said, touching my face. I don't want to. I like you so much. I told you, you make me feel real, more real than I've ever thought I could feel, more alive. You, you're better than a hundred Californias, but it's not only that, it's better than all those white birds, I said around the ache that was in my throat again because you're better than anything or anyone for me, too, Annie. Better than, oh, I don't know, better than what? Better than everything. But that's not what I want to be saying. You, you're, Annie, I think I love you. I heard myself say it as if I were someone else. But the moment the words were out, I knew more than I'd ever known anything that they were true. Dear Annie, I've just been remembering Thanksgiving vacation and the beach near Coney Island. Annie, it makes me ache for you. It... Liza crumpled the letter, then smoothed it out again, tore it to shreds, and went outside. She walked beside the Charles River in the cold. The air was brittle with the coming winter. One sailboat struggled against the biting wind. The guy in that boat's crazy, she thought absently. His sail will freeze. His hands will stick to the main sheet and they'll have to pry him loose. Annie, she thought, the name driving everything else away. Annie, Annie. Chapter 8 School seemed strange the Monday after Thanksgiving. In a way, it was nice to be back because it was familiar, but it also seemed irrelevant as if I'd grown up and school was now part of my childhood. I was almost surprised to see the ballot box in the main hall and kids dropping folded pieces of paper in it. It wasn't that I'd really forgotten the election. It was just that it was part of my old world, too, and it had lost a lot of its importance. So I was quite calm when, after lunch, we were all told to report to the lower school gym, which doubled as an auditorium for a few announcements. Ms. Baxter gave me a big, cheerful smile. I supposed to be forgiving and encouraging, but Mrs. Poindexter, 
in a purple dress I'd never seen before, her glasses dangling, looked grim. I must have won, I quipped to Sally. Look at her. She looks as if she swallowed a cactus. But Sally didn't laugh. In fact, I soon realized she must be nervous about something because she kept licking her lips and she was clutching a couple of index cards, shuffling them around, picking at the corners. Ladies and gentlemen, said Mrs. Poindexter, her usual way of addressing large groups of us. I have two announcements. The first and briefer one is that Eliza Winthrop will continue as head of student council. There was quite a bit of applause, and school began mattering more to me again. And the second, Mrs. Poindexter said, holding up her hand for silence, is that Walter Shander and Sally Gerald have very kindly agreed to be student chair people for our fundraising drive. Sally has a few words to say. Sally? Sally got up, still fidgeting nervously with her index cards. Well, I just want to say, she piped, that I realized over Thanksgiving what a terrible thing I, I did with the ear piercing and all, and Walt and I talked over what I could do to make it up to the school, and then this morning, Miss Baxter said Mrs. Poindexter wanted students to get involved in the campaign, and so then I thought I could do that, and Walt said he'd help. I, I really want to make up to everyone for what I did, and this way, if anyone on the outside finds out about it, the ear infections, I mean, It'll be easier for Mrs. Poindexter and everyone to say that I'm really sorry. I swallowed against the sick feeling that was creeping up my throat from my stomach. It wasn't that I didn't think it was a nice thing for Sally to do. I did. It was that she seemed to be doing it for the wrong reasons. If the campaign's a success, she was saying, that means that Foster can go on giving people a good education. Later, Walt and I will tell you about some dances and rallies and things we're planning. But right now, I wanted first of all to apologize. And secondly, well, to ask for your support in the campaign. She blushed and ran back to her seat. There was applause again, but this time it was uncertain, as if the other kids were as surprised and as uncomfortable as I was about Sally's making so much of the ear piercing. She made it sound as if she thought she'd murdered someone. But Mrs. Poindexter and Miss Baxter looked like a couple of Cheshire cats, one large and one small. How was I? Sally asked. Great, baby. Terrific, Walt said, hugging her. Wasn't she great, Liza? Sure, I said, not wanting to hurt anyone's feelings. After school, I went to the art studio to do some work on my senior project. Sally and Walt were there, bent over a huge piece of poster board, painting, and I had to admit that Sally looked happier and more relaxed than I'd seen her for some time. Maybe, I thought, doing this won't be so bad for her after all. Hi, Liza, Walt called cheerfully as I rummaged in the supply cabinet. What shall we put you down for? We're making a list. How much do you think you can pledge? Pledge? I asked, not understanding. That's the word Mr. Piccolo says fundraisers use, Sally said proudly. It means, how much do you promise to give to the Foster Fund Drive? Doesn't that sound good, Liza? Foster Fund Drive? So, um, metaphoric. Alliterative, I grumbled, sitting down. Welcome back, Liza, Ms. Stevenson said, peering out from behind her easel, where she was working, as usual, on what we all jokingly call her masterpiece. It was a large, abstract painting none of us understood. Thanks, I said, poking a pair of dividers down so hard I made a hole in my paper. Miss Stevenson's pledged $25, Sally said sweetly, waving a small notebook. I don't know what I can give yet, Sally, okay? I told her. Okay, okay, she snapped. You don't have to be that way about it. Then her angry expression vanished as if it had been erased, and she got up and put her hand on my shoulder. Oh, Liza, I'm sorry, she moaned. It's me who shouldn't have been that way. I'm sorry I snapped at you for being uncertain. She patted my shoulder. Miss Baxter, I thought. She's been talking to Miss Baxter. That's what it is. But of course I couldn't say that. It's okay, I muttered, glancing at Walt, who shrugged. Miss Stevenson dropped a large tube of zinc white 
and Sally and Walt nearly crashed into each other trying to be first to pick it up for her. I pushed away from the drawing table, muttered something about homework, and ran out of the art studio. Before I even thought about it consciously, I was in the phone booth in the basement, dialing Annie's number. As I waited for someone to answer, I reluctantly noticed the paint peeling off the steam pipes that ran along the walls and a big crack that ran from the ceiling almost to the floor. All right, all right, I said silently. I'll do something for the silly campaign. Hello, came Nana's gentle voice. Hi, I said. I never knew whether to call her Nana to her face or not. This is Liza. Is Annie there? Hello, Liz. Yes, Annie's here. How you been? When you come see us? I'm fine, I said, suddenly nervous. I'll come soon. Okay, you not forget. Just a minute, I call Annie. I could hear her calling in the background and was relieved to hear Annie answer. And I closed my eyes, trying to visualize her in her apartment. Only it was the beach that came back to me, and I could feel myself starting to sweat. But it still made sense to me. Every time that scene came back to me, it made sense. Hi, Liza, came Annie's voice, sounding glad. Hi. I laughed for no reason I could think of. I don't know why I'm calling you, I said, except this has been a weird day, and you're the only part of my life that seems sane. Did you get it? Get what? Oh, Liza, did you get reelected? Oh, that. It seemed about as far away as Mars and about as important. Yes, I got it. I'm so glad. She paused and said, Liza, I... and stopped. What? I was going to say that I missed you all day, and I kept wondering about the election, and I missed you too, I heard myself saying. Liza? I felt my heart speed up again, and my hands were damp. I rubbed them on my jeans and tried to concentrate on the crack in the wall. Liza, are you... Are you sorry? You know, about, you know, about Sunday? I realized I was twisting the phone cord and tried to straighten it out again. I also noticed a bunch of juniors coming down the hall toward the phone booth, laughing and jostling each other. I closed my eyes to make them go away, to stay alone with Annie. No, I said. I'm not sorry. Confused, maybe. I... I keep trying not to think much about it, but... I wrote you a dumb letter, Annie said softly, but I didn't mail it. Do I get to see it? She hesitated, then said, Sure, come on up, can you? I didn't even look at my watch before I said, Yes. It was cold and very damp outside, as if it were going to snow, but it was warm in Annie's room. She had some quiet music on her rickety old-fashioned phonograph, and her hair was in two braids, which by now I knew usually meant she hadn't had time to wash it or that she'd been doing something active or messy, like helping her mother clean. We just looked at each other for a minute there in the doorway of her room, as if neither of us knew what to say or how to act with each other. But I felt myself leave Sally and school and the fundraising drive behind me, the way a cicada leaves its shell when it turns from an immature grub into its almost grown-up self. Annie took my hand shyly, pulled me into her room, and shut the door. Hi, she said. I felt myself smiling, wanting to laugh with pleasure at seeing her, but also needing to laugh out of nervousness, I guess. Hi. Then we both did laugh, like a couple of idiots, standing there awkwardly looking at each other. And we both moved at the same time into each other's arms, hugging. It was just a friendly hug at first, and I'm so glad to see you hug. But then I began to be very aware of Annie's body pressed against mine and of feeling her heart beat against my breast. So I moved away. Sorry, she said, turning away also. I touched her shoulder. It was rigid. No, no, don't be. You moved away so fast. I, Annie, please. Please what? Please I don't know. Can't we just be friends? She said, whirling around. Just friends? Wonderful stock phrase, isn't it? Only what she said on the beach was, was... She turned away again, covering her face with her hands. Annie, I said miserably. Annie, Annie, I... 
I do love you, Annie. There, I thought. That's the second time I've said it. Annie groped on her desk table and handed me an envelope. I'm sorry, she said. I didn't get any sleep last night and, well, I couldn't tell you a single thing anyone said in school today, even at rehearsal. I'm going to wash my face. I nodded, trying to smile at her as if everything was all right. There's no reason, I remember thinking, why it shouldn't be. And I sat down on the edge of Annie's bed and opened the letter. Dear Liza, it's 3.30 in the morning, and this is the fifth time I've tried to write this to you. Someone said something about three o'clock in the morning being the dark night of the soul. Something like that. That's true, at least for this three o'clock and this soul. Look, I have to be honest. I want to try to be, anyhow. I told you about Beverly because I knew at that point that I loved you. I was trying to warn you, I guess. As I said, I've wondered for a long time if I was gay. I even tried to prove I wasn't last summer with a boy, but it was ridiculous. I know you said on the beach that you think you love me, and I've been trying to hold on to that, but I'm still scared that if I told you everything about how I feel, you might not be ready for it. Maybe you've already felt pressured into thinking you have to feel the same way, out of politeness, sort of, because you like me and don't want to hurt my feelings. The thing is, the thing is, since you haven't thought about it, about being gay, I'm trying to tell myself very firmly that it wouldn't be fair of me to, I don't know, influence you, try to push you into something you don't want or don't want yet or something. Liza, I think what I'm saying is that, really, if you don't want us to see each other anymore, it's okay. Love, Annie. I stood there holding the letter and looking at the word love at the end of it, knowing that I was jealous of the boy Annie'd mentioned and that my not seeing Annie anymore would be as ridiculous for me as she said her experiment with the boy had been for her. Could I even begin an experiment like that, I wondered, startled. Would I? It was true I'd never consciously thought about being gay, but it also seemed true that if I were, that might pull together not only what had been happening between me and Annie all along and how I felt about her, but also a lot of things in my life before I'd known her, things I'd never let myself think about much. Even when I was little, I'd often felt as if I didn't quite fit in with most of the people around me. I'd felt isolated in some way that I never understood. And as I got older, well, in the last two or three years, I'd wondered why I'd rather go to the movies with Sally or some other girl than with a boy, and why, when I imagined living with someone someday, permanently I mean, that person was always female. I read Annie's letter again, and again felt how ridiculous not seeing her anymore would be, how much I'd miss her too. When Annie came back from the bathroom, she stood across the room watching me for a few minutes. I could tell she was trying very hard to pretend her letter didn't matter, but her eyes were so bright that I was pretty sure they were wet. I'd tear this up, I said finally, if it weren't for the fact that it's the first letter you've ever written me, and so I want to keep it. Oh, Liza, she said softly, not moving. Are you sure? I felt my face getting hot and my heart speeding up again. Annie's eyes were so intent on mine, it was as if we were standing with no distance between us, but there was the whole room. I think I nodded, and I know I held out my hand. I felt about three years old. She took my hand, and then she touched my face. I still don't want to rush you, she said softly. I... it scares me too, Liza. I... I just recognize it more, maybe... Right now, I just want to feel you close to me, I said, or something like it, and in a few minutes, we were lying down on Annie's bed, holding each other and sometimes kissing, but not really touching, mostly just being happy, still scared, though, too. Chapter 9 That winter, all Annie had to do was walk into a room or appear at a bus stop or a corner where we were meeting and I didn't even have to think about smiling. I could feel my face smiling all on its own. We saw each other every afternoon that we could, 
and on weekends, and call each other just about every night, and even that didn't seem enough. Sometimes we even arranged to call each other from payphones at lunchtime. It was a good thing I never had much trouble with schoolwork, because I floated through classes, writing letters to Annie or daydreaming. The fundraising campaign went on around me without my paying much attention to it. I did pledge some money. I listened to Sally and Walt make speeches. I even helped them collect pledges from some of the other kids. But I was never really there, because Annie filled my mind. Songs I heard on the radio suddenly seemed to fit Annie and me. Poems I read seemed written especially for us. We began sending each other poems that we liked. I would have gone broke buying Annie plants if I hadn't known how much it bothered her that I often had money and she usually didn't. We kept finding new things about New York to show each other. It was as if we were both seeing the city for the first time. One afternoon, I suddenly noticed and then showed Annie how the sunlight dripped over the ugly face of her building, softening it and making it glow almost as if there were a mysterious light source hidden inside its drab walls. And Annie showed me how Alanethus trees grow under subway and sewer gratings, stretching toward the sun, making shelter in the summer, she said, laughing for the small dragons that live under the street. Much of that winter was, magical is the only word again, and a big part of that magic was that, no matter how much of ourselves we found to give each other, there was always more we wanted to give. One Saturday in early December, we got our parents to agree to let us go out to dinner together. Why shouldn't we? Annie had said to me. It was her idea. People go out for dinner on dates and stuff, don't they? She grinned and said formally, Liza Winthrop, I'd like to make a date with you for dinner. I know this great Italian restaurant. It was a great Italian restaurant. It was in the West Village and tiny, with no more than 10 or 12 tables. And the ones along the wall, where we sat, were separated by iron scrollwork partitions, so we had the illusion of privacy, if not privacy itself. It was dark, too. Our main light came from a candle in a Chianti bottle. Annie's face looked golden and soft, like the face of a woman in a Renaissance painting. What's this? I asked, pointing to a long name on the menu and trying to resist the urge to touch Annie's lovely face. Scapoloni al Marsala? Annie's laugh was as warm as the candlelight. No, no, she corrected. Scalapini, scalapini alla marsala. Scalapini alla marsala, I repeated. What is it? It's veal, she said. Vitella. Sort of like thin veal cutlets in a wonderful sauce. Is it, is it good? I asked. But I was still thinking of the way she'd said vitello, with a musical pause between the L's. Annie laughed again and kissed the closed fingers of her right hand. Then she popped her fingers open and tossed her hand up in a cliché but airy gesture that came straight out of a movie about Venice we'd seen the week before. Is it good, she said. Nana makes it. So we both had scallopini alla marsala after an antipasto and along with a very illegal half bottle of wine. And then Annie convinced me to try a wonderful pastry called cannoli. And after that we had espresso. And still we sat there with no one asking us to leave. We stayed so late that both my parents and Annie's were furious when we got home. You never call any more, Liza, my father said, muttering something about wishing I'd see other people besides Annie. I don't want to set a curfew, he said, but two girls wandering around New York at night? It just isn't safe. Dad was right, but time with Annie was real time stopped, and more and more often we both forgot to call. Chad kept kidding me that I was in love and asking with whom, and then Sally and Walt did too, and after a while I didn't even mind, because even if they had the wrong idea about it, they were right. Soon it wasn't hard anymore to say it, to myself, I mean, as well as over and over again to Annie, and to accept her saying it to me. We touched each other more easily, just kissed or held hands or hugged each other, though, nothing more than that. We didn't really talk much about being gay. Most of the time, we just talked about ourselves. We were what seemed important then, not some label. 
The day the first snow fell was a Saturday, and Annie and I called each other up at exactly the same moment, over and over again, tying up our phones with busy signals for ten minutes. I don't remember which of us got through first, but around an hour later, we were both running through Central Park like a couple of maniacs, making snow angels and pelting each other with snowballs. We even built a fort with the help of three little boys and their big brother, who was our age, and after that we all bought chestnuts and pretzels and sat on a bench eating them till the boys had to go home. Some of the chestnuts were rotten. I remember that because Annie said, throwing one away, it's the first sign of a dying city, rotten chestnuts. I could even laugh at that, along with the boys, because I knew that the ugly things about New York weren't bothering her so much anymore. Annie and I went ice skating a few times, and we tried to get our parents to let us go to Vermont to ski, but they wouldn't. Mr. Kenyon took us and Nana and Annie's mother out to Westchester in his cab just before Christmas to look at the lights on people's houses, and they all wished me Bon Natale when they dropped me off at home. On Christmas afternoon, I gave Annie a ring. Oh, Liza, she said, groping in the pocket of her coat. We were on the promenade, and it had just begun to snow. Look. Out of her pocket, she took a little box, the same size as a little box i just handed her. I looked around for people, and then kissed the end of her nose. It was almost dark, and besides, I didn't really care if anyone saw us. Is the silly grin on my face? I asked her. As silly as the silly grin on your face? Jerk, she said. Open your present. You first. I can't. My hands are shaking. You know what happens to my gloves if I take them off. What happens to your gloves if you take them off is you lose them. But you don't lose them if you give them to me. I held out my hand. I'll hold your gloves, unicorn, okay? Okay, okay, she said, and stripped them off and fumbled with the metallic ribbon on the box with a wonderful clumsiness that I have never seen anyone else as graceful as Annie have. Oh, for God's sake, I said, I'll bite it off if it's stuck. You will not. It's my first Christmas present from you, and I'm going to keep every scrap of it forever, ribbon and all. Oh, Liza. By then she had the box open and was staring down at the little gold ring with the pale blue stone that I'd found in an antique shop on Atlantic Avenue at the edge of Brooklyn Heights. Liza, Liza, she said, looking at me, no, staring with wonder. I don't believe this. She nodded toward the box I was holding. Open yours. I gave Annie back her gloves and stuffed my own into my pockets, and I opened the box she had handed me and found a gold ring with a pale green stone. No, not identical to the ring I'd given her, but almost. I don't believe it either, I said, but I also do. It's some kind of sign. Come on. It is, Liza. You know it is. The occult sciences, I said, intentionally pompous, are the only ones that would even attempt to explain this kind of coincidence. And the occult sciences are not... Annie flung her arms around my neck and kissed me, even though there were four kids galloping down the snowy path from Clark Street to the promenade, showering each other with snowballs. If you don't put that ring on this minute, I'm going to take it back, Annie whispered in my ear. Occult science is indeed. She leaned back, looking at me, her hands still on my shoulders, her eyes shining softly at me and snow falling, melting on her nose. Bon Natale, she whispered, amore mio. Merry Christmas, my love, I answered. My parents and Chad and I went up to Annie's school to hear her recital, which had been postponed till right after Christmas because of snow. Annie had said many times that the only decent teacher in the whole school was her music teacher, and the only department, even counting phys ed, that tried to do anything with extracurricular activities was the music department. As soon as I heard Annie sing that night, I could see why a music department would give recitals as long as Annie was around to be in them. Hearing Annie sing in the recital was nothing like hearing her sing in the museum that first day, or hearing her hum around her apartment, or mine, or 
on the street the way I had a few times since then. I knew she had a lovely voice, and I knew from the time in the museum that she could put a lot of feeling behind what she sang, but this was more than all those things combined. The other kids in the recital were good, maybe the way I'd expected Annie to be, but right before Annie sang, she looked out at the audience as if to say, Listen, there's this really beautiful song I'd like you to hear, as if she wanted to make the audience a present of it. The audience seemed to know something unusual was coming, for when Annie looked at them, they settled back, calm and happy and expectant. And when she started singing, you couldn't even hear anyone breathe. I glanced at Dad and Mom and Chad to see if maybe it was my loving Annie that made me think she was so good, but I could see from their faces and from the faces of the other people, not just her family, who looked about ready to burst with pride, that everyone else thought she was as good as I did. I'm not sure how to describe Annie's voice, or if anyone really could, except maybe a music critic. It's a low soprano, a mezzo-soprano is its technical name, and it's a little husky. Not gravelly husky, but rich. And, according to my mother, it's 100% on pitch all the time. It's also almost perfectly in control. When Annie wants to fill a room with her voice, she can, but she can also make it as soft as a whisper, a whisper you can always hear. But none of that was what made the audience sit there, not moving every time Annie sang. It was the feeling again, the same thing that first drew me to Annie in the museum, only much, much more so. Annie's singing was so spontaneous, and she gave so much of herself that it sounded as if she'd actually written each song or was making each one up as she went along, the way she'd done in the museum. When she sang something sad, I wanted to cry. When she sang something happy, I felt myself smiling. Dad said he felt the same, and Mom had a long, serious talk with Annie the next afternoon about becoming a professional. But Annie said she wasn't sure yet if she wanted to, although she knew she wanted to major in music and continue singing no matter what else she did. Chad, even though he was shy with girls, gave her a big hug after the performance and said, There's nothing to say, Annie. You were so good. I couldn't think of anything to say either. Mostly, I just wanted to put my arms around her, but at the same time, I felt in awe of her. This was a whole new Annie, an Annie I hardly knew. I don't remember what I did or said, squeezed her hand, I think, and said something lame but she said later that she didn't care what anyone thought except me. I had the flu that winter, badly, sometime late in January, I think it was. The night before, I was fine, but the next morning I woke up with my throat on fire and my head feeling as if a team of Clydesdales were galloping through it. Mom made me go back to bed and came in every couple of hours with something for me to drink. I think the only reason I remember the doctor's making one of his rare house calls is because I nearly choked on the pills that Mom gave me to take after he'd left. Sometime that first afternoon, though, I heard voices outside my door. Mom had let Chad wave to me from the threshold earlier, and it was too early for Dad to be home, so I knew it couldn't be either of them. And then Annie was beside me, with Mom protesting from the door. It's okay, Mrs. Winthrop, she was saying. I had the flu this year already. Liar, I whispered, when Mom finally left. Last year, this year, said Annie, turning the cloth on my head to its cooler side. It's all the same. She put her hand on my cheek. You must feel rotten. Not so much rotten, I said, as not here as if I were floating very far away. I don't want to be far away from you, I said, reaching for her hand, but I am. I really must have been pretty sick because I could barely concentrate, even on Annie. 
Annie held my hand, stroking it softly. Don't talk, she said. I won't let you float away. You can't go far with me holding on to you. I'll keep you here, love. Shh. She began to sing very softly and sweetly, and although I was still floating, I was riding on clouds now, with Annie's voice in her hand gently anchoring me to earth. We didn't always use words when we were together. We didn't need to. That was uncanny, but maybe the best thing of all. Although I don't think we thought about it much, it just happened. There's a Greek legend, no, it's in something Plato wrote, about how true lovers are really two halves of the same person. It says that people wander around searching for their other half. And when they find him or her, they are finally whole and perfect. The thing that gets me is that the story says that originally all people were really pairs of people joined back to back, and that some of the pairs were man and man, some woman and woman, and others man and woman. What happened was that all of these double people went to war with the gods, and the gods, to punish them, split them all in two. That's why some lovers are heterosexual and some are homosexual, female and female, or male and male. I loved that story when I first heard it, in junior year, I think it was, because it seemed fair and right and sensible. But that winter, I really began to believe it was true, because the more Annie and I learned about each other, the more I felt she was the other half of me. The oddest thing, perhaps, was that even as the winter went on, we still didn't touch each other much more than we had at the beginning, after around Christmas, I mean. But we did realize more and more that winter that we wanted to. I especially realized it, I guess, since it was so new to me. And the more we realized it, the more we tried to avoid it. No, the more I did, at least at first. We were in Annie's room. Her parents were out and Nana was asleep. We were listening to an opera on the radio and we were sitting on the floor. My head was in Annie's lap and her hand was on my hair, moving softly to my throat, then to my breast. And I sat up and reached for the radio, fiddling with the dial, saying something dumb like, the volume's fading, which it wasn't. We were in my kitchen. My parents and Chad were in the living room watching TV. Annie had stayed for dinner, and we were doing the dishes. I put my arms around her from behind and held her body so close to mine that I wasn't sure whose pulse I felt throbbing. But when she turned to me, I reached quickly for the dish towel and a plate. Then it began happening the other way around, too. Annie began moving away from me. I remember one time in the subway... It was pretty late, and for a minute there was no one in the car with us. So I leaned over and kissed Annie, and she stiffened, holding herself away from me, rigid. The worst thing was that we were too shy to talk about it, and we got so tangled up that we began misunderstanding each other more and more often, just in general, and the wordless communication we prized so much weakened, and we began to fight about dumb things like what time we were going to meet and what we were going to do or whether Annie was coming to my apartment or I was going to hers or if we should take the subway or the bus. The worst fight was in March. We'd gone to the museum, the Metropolitan, and Annie seemed to want to stay in front of the medieval choir screen forever and I wanted to go to the Temple of Dinder. There's nothing to look at, I said nastily. She was just staring. At least, that's what it looked like to me. You must have memorized every curly cue by now. Really, how many of those post things are there? I pointed to one of the hundreds of vertical shafts of which the screen is made. Annie turned to me, blazing. I'd never seen her so angry. Look, why don't you just go to your silly temple if you want to so much? Some people can pray better in the dark, that's all. But you probably don't pray at all. You're so pure and sure of everything. A guard glanced in our direction, 
as if he were trying to decide whether to tell us to be quiet. We weren't talking loud yet, but we were getting there. I was mad enough to ignore most of what Annie'd said till later. I just turned and walked away, past the guard, to the temple. I must have stayed there for a good half hour, until it hit me that I'd said the first rotten thing. But when I walked back to the choir screen, ready to apologize, Annie was gone. Did Annie call? I asked casually when I got home around 6.30. No, Mom said, giving me an odd look. I don't think I said a word during dinner, and all evening I jumped every time the phone rang. Liza had a fight, Chad sang gleefully the third time I ran for the phone and had to turn it over to someone else, usually him. Hmm, Liza, betcha you and Annie thought her were some boy, huh? Or, that will do, Chad, Mom said, looking at me. Haven't you got homework? If he hasn't, I have, I said, and fled to my room, slamming the door. At about ten o'clock, when Chad was in the shower, I called Annie, but Nana said she'd gone to bed. Could you, could you see if she's still awake? I asked humbly. There was a pause, and then Nana said, Lies, you have a fight with Annie, no? Yes, I admitted. I could almost hear her head nodding. I guess that when I see her come in, she look all fussed. Maybe you call tomorrow, eh? It's none of my business, but sometimes people just need a little time. I knew she was right, but I couldn't let it go. I didn't want to go to sleep thinking Annie was mad at me, or that I'd hurt her in some unforgivable way. Could you... could you just tell her I'm sorry, I said? Sure, Nana sounded relieved. I tell her, but you hang up now. Call tomorrow, okay? Okay, I said, hanging up. Mom's hand was on my shoulder the moment I put down the receiver. Liza, she began. Liza, shouldn't we talk about this? You seem so upset, honey. What? But I wrenched away and ran back to my room, where I read until dawn, mostly Shakespeare's sonnets, and cried over the ones I had once copied out and sent to Annie. The next afternoon, I ran most of the way home from school, so I'd get there before Chad. I knew Mom had a meeting, and I wanted to be sure I was alone when I called Annie. But Annie was waiting outside my building, sitting on the steps in a heavy red and black lumber jacket I'd never seen before. I was so surprised to see her, I just stopped and stood there. But she got up right away and came toward me, her arms woodenly at her sides. The lumber jacket was so big, it looked as though it belonged to someone else. Want to go for a walk? she asked. She looked haggard, as if she hadn't slept any more than I had. I nodded, and we walked silently toward the promenade. I kept twisting Annie's ring with the thumb and little finger of the hand it was on, wondering if she was going to want it back. Annie leaned against the railing and seemed to be trying to follow the progress of the Staten Island Ferry through the fog. Annie, I began finally... Annie, I... She turned, leaning her back against the railing. Nana told me you called and that you were sorry, she said. Accepted. But, but, I said, my heart racing. She hadn't smiled yet, and I knew I hadn't either. But, said Annie, turning back to face the harbor, soft hair blowing around her face. Liza, we're like the temple and the choir screen as I thought the day I met you, only then I was just guessing. You, you really are like the temple, light. You go happily on without really noticing, and I'm dark, like the choir screen, like the room it's in. I feel too much and want too much, I guess, and she turned to face me again. Her eyes were desolate. I want to be in the real world with you, Liza, for you, but but we're still running away. Or you are, or... <laughs> Liza, I don't want to be afraid of this, of of the physical part of loving you, but you're making me afraid and guilty because you seem to think it's wrong or dirty or something. Maybe you did all along. I don't know. No, I interrupted loudly, unable to keep still any longer. No, not dirty, Annie, not... 
I don't want to make you afraid, I finished lamely. For a minute, Annie seemed to be waiting for me to say something else, but I couldn't just then. I really was praying there in the museum, she said softly, when you got so mad. I was praying that I could ignore it if you wanted me to. Not the love, but the physical part of it. But having to do that, I think that makes me more afraid than facing it would. It came crashing through my foggy mind that, in spite of everything Annie had just said, I wanted desperately to touch her, to hold her, and then I was able to speak again. It's not true, I said carefully, that I want to ignore it, and I'm not going on happily not noticing. I stopped, feeling Annie take my hand, and realized my fists were clenched. It scares me too, Annie, I managed to say, but not because I think it's wrong or anything. At least, I don't think it's that. It's, it's mostly because it's so strong, the love and the friendship and every part of it. I think that was when I finally realized that, as I said it. But you always move away, she said. You do too. I, I know. Then we both looked out at the harbor again, as if we'd just met and were shy with each other again. But at least after that, we were able to begin talking about it. It's timing, partly. It's as if we never want the same thing at the same time, I said. We were sitting on the sofa in my parents' living room. My parents and Chad were out, but we didn't know for how long. I don't think so, said Annie. It's the one thing we don't know about each other, the one thing we aren't letting each other know, as if we're blocking the channels because... because we're so scared of it, Liza. The real question still is why? She reached for my hand. I wish we could just sort of... Let what happens happen, she said, without thinking so much about it. Her thumb was moving gently on my hand. Her eyes had a special soft look in them I've never seen in anyone's but Annie's, and only in Annie's when she looked at me. I'll promise to try not to move away next time, she said. I, I'll promise to, I said, my mouth so dry the words scraped. Right now, I don't think I could stop anything from happening that started. But a few minutes later, my father's key turned in the lock, and we both jumped guiltily away from each other. And that was when there began to be that problem, too, that there was really no place where we could be alone. Of course, there were times when no one was home at Annie's apartment or mine, but we were always afraid that someone would walk in. And it wasn't long before we began using that fear to mask our deeper one. We were still restrained and hesitant with each other. But maybe, and I think this is true, maybe we also just needed more time. Chapter 10 Finally, the dreary cold winter warmed up and leaves started bursting out on the trees. Daffodils and tulips and those blue flowers that grow in clusters on stiff stems began to pop up all over the heights. And Annie and I spent much more time outdoors, which helped a little. Annie discovered more dooryard gardens, even on my own street, that I ever thought existed. We managed to go for a lot of walks that spring, even though Annie was very busy with rehearsals for a new recital, and I was trying to finish my senior project and was helping Sally and Walt with the fun drive. Things really did look pretty bad for Foster. Late one afternoon, a week and a half before spring vacation, Mrs. Poindexter called me into her office. Eliza, she said, settling back into her brown chair and actually almost smiling. Eliza, I have been most pleased with your conduct these last months. You have shown none of the immaturity that steered you so wrongly last fall. Your grades have, as usual, been excellent, and Ms. Baxter reports to me that you have at least begun to show an interest in the fun drive. Needless to say, your record is now clear. Mrs. Poindexter, I asked after I recovered from the relief I felt. Is it true that Foster might have to close? Mrs. Poindexter gave me a long look. Then she sighed and said gently, I'm afraid it is, dear. 
Mrs. Poindexter had never called anyone dear, as far as I knew. Certainly never me. Eliza, you have been going to foster since kindergarten. That's nearly 13 years, almost your entire lifetime. Some of our teachers have been here much longer. I myself have been headmistress for 25 years. It would be awful, I said, suddenly feeling sorry for her, if Foster had to close. Mrs. Poindexter sniffed and fingered her glasses chain. We have tried to make it the best possible school. We have never had the money to compete with schools like Brerley, but... She smiled and reached out, patting my hand. But this needn't concern you, although I appreciate your sympathy. What I need from you, what Foster needs from you, she said, squaring her shoulders, is a heightened participation in the fund drive. You, as student council president, have enormous influence, a certain public influence as well, I may say, or you could have if you would use your position advantageously. I licked my lips. If she was going to ask me to make speeches, I was going to have to use every bit of self-control I had not to say no. Making just the required campaign speeches after I was nominated for council president had been one of the hardest things I'd ever done. Even when I had to get up in front of English class and give an oral report, I always felt as if I were going to my execution. The fun drive, said Mrs. Poindexter, picking up her desk calendar, must be speeded up. We have so little time now before the end of school. Mr. Piccolo and the fundraiser tell me, we are still far short of our goal, and the recruit recruitment campaign has not, so far, been a success. Mr. Piccolo says it is his feeling that interest will pick up in the spring, so there is hope, she smiled. Eliza, I'm sure you will agree that this is the time for student council to take an active part, to lead the other students, to give Sally and Walt, who are working so very hard, a real boost, so to speak. Well, I said, we could talk about it at the next meeting, but there isn't another, is there, till after vacation? There is now, Mrs. Poindexter said triumphantly, pointing at the calendar with her glasses. I have scheduled one, assuming, of course, that you and the others can go, but you will find that out for me, won't you, like my good right hand? I've scheduled a special council meeting for this Friday afternoon. And because Mr. Piccolo and his publicity committee will be using the parlor for an emergency fund drive meeting of their own, and because my apartment is too small and the school dining room seems inappropriate, I have asked Ms. Stevenson as student council advisor to volunteer her home, and she and Ms. Woodmere have very kindly agreed. She leaned back, still smiling. Isn't that kind of them? I just looked at her for a minute, not knowing what may be matter. Her calling a council meeting without saying anything to me first, or her making Miss Stevenson and Miss Woodmere volunteer to have it where they lived. You are free Friday afternoon, aren't you? For a second, I was tempted to invent an unbreakable dentist appointment, but, well, if Foster's really in trouble, I thought, I can't very well go around throwing obstacles in its way. Besides, I felt pretty sure Mrs. Poindexter would go ahead with the meeting, even if I weren't there. Yes, I said, trying not to say it too obviously through my teeth. Sure, I'm free. Mrs. Poindexter's smile broadened. Good girl, she said, and you will notify the others or ask Mary Lou to do so? You shouldn't have to, actually, being the president. I think it was that last remark her making a big deal of my being president after scheduling a meeting without even notifying me till afterwards that made me storm over to the art studio. Miss Stevenson was washing brushes. I've been working on the railroad, she sang softly above the sound of running water, all the live long day. Hello, Liza. You been working on the railroad too? If, I said, yanking out a chair and throwing myself down at one of the tables, that's a subtle way of making a comment about being railroaded into a certain council meeting. Yes, I sure have been. I just came from Mrs. Poindexter's office. Only the spikes got pounded into me instead of into the railroad ties or something. I don't know. Well, said Miss Stevenson, carefully stroking a brush back and forth against her palm to see if the color was out of it yet. 
I suppose I should point out that it's all for a good cause. We need Foster. Now Foster needs us. Mrs. Poindexter means well, after all. I know, I said, sighing, more discouraged than before. Since Miss Stevenson seemed so calm. But damn it, sorry, darn it, it's the principle of the thing. She might have asked me first, or even just told me, and she might have asked to use your place instead of making you volunteer it. Volunteer, ha! Miss Stevenson laughed. It was Miss Baxter who asked, on Mrs. Poindexter's behalf. I don't think she enjoyed doing it, though. I don't think she quite approves of students going to teachers' homes. I should think she'd love it, I grumbled. Disciples at one's feet and all that. Cheer up, Liza, Miss Stevenson said. Except I warn you, the feet part will probably be true. We don't have all that many chairs. Don't you mind at all? I asked incredulously. Doesn't Miss Woodmare mind? She's not even on council. I mean, weren't you even mad that Mrs. Poindexter just, just up and ordered the whole thing? Council's supposed to be democratic for, for Pete's sake. Miss Stevenson's face crinkled around her eyes. Mind? She said, pointing to the wastebasket, which I now saw was a quarter full of crumpled scraps of paper with angry looking writing all over them. The one thing that having a temper has taught me, Liza, she said, is that most of the time it's better to do one's exploding in private. But the thing is, we do have to remember that she is the headmistress, and she has done a lot for the school for many, many years, and, oh, blast it, Liza, not everyone can be as true to all the principles of democracy as you and I, can they? Well, that made me laugh, which made me feel a little better. But I wonder if Miss Stevenson would be quite so understanding of Mrs. Poindexter now as she was then. None of us had ever been to Miss Stevenson's and Miss Woodmere's house before. Well, maybe Mrs. Poindexter had, or Miss Baxter, but none of the kids had. Their house was in Cobble Hill, which is separated from Brooklyn Heights by Atlantic Avenue. Cobble Hill used to be considered a bad neighborhood. My mother never let me and Chad cross Atlantic when we were little, but I don't think it was ever that bad. People have fixed up a lot of the houses there now, and it's a nice mixture of nationalities and ages and kinds of jobs. Unpretentious, I guess you could call it. Something the Heights tries to be, but isn't. The house where Miss Stevenson and Miss Woodmere lived was just that. A house which is unusual in New York, where most people live in apartments. It's a townhouse, attached to a lot of other houses, so it's technically part of a row house. There are two long row houses, containing ten or so townhouses each, facing one another across a wonderfully tangled private garden. Miss Baxter, Miss Stevenson told us that day, lived on the other side of the garden and about three doors down. Behind each set of houses was a cobblestone strip with separate little garden areas, one per tenant. Everyone's back door opened onto that strip, so people sat outside a lot and talked. Everyone was very friendly. The special council meeting was the afternoon of the night of Annie's spring recital, and she was resting, so I went right down to Cobble Hill after school. I was the first to arrive. Miss Stevenson and Miss Woodmere showed me around and kidded me about my professional interest in the house. There were three floors. I didn't see the top one where the bedrooms were, but I saw both the others, basically two rooms per floor and very cozy. The bottom floor had the kitchen, which was huge and bright, with gleaming white flecked with black linoleum, copper colored appliances, and dark wood cabinets. The back door leading out to the cobblestones and the garden was off that, there was a tiny bathroom off the kitchen and a little hall at the foot of the stairs with a bare brick wall covered with hanging plants. The dining room was off that with more exposed brick and a heavy beam ceiling. This is our cave, Ms. Woodmere said, showing it to me, especially in winter when it's dark at dinner time. I could see that it would be cave-like because of the heavy low beams in the little window. Also, the ground was higher at the front of the house than at the back dropping the dining room below ground level so its window looked out on people's feet as they passed by. Two of the walls were lined with books, which added to the cave-like atmosphere. 
Upstairs on the second floor were the living room and a sort of study or workroom. A steep flight of steps led from the front garden area to the front door, which led directly into the study. There was an old-fashioned nail slot in the door, and I thought how much nicer and more private that must be than getting one's mail from a locked box in the entryway, as we did. Here's where your fates are decided, Ms. Woodmere laughed, pointing to the pile of papers on her desk, topped with her roll book. Miss Stevenson had an easel set up near the window, and art supplies neatly arranged on a shelf against the wall. The living room was on the other side of the stairwell, comfortable and cozy like the rest of the house. There were lots of plants around, records and books everywhere, nice pictures on the walls, many of them, Miss Stevenson said, done by former students, and two enormous cats, one black and one orange, who followed us everywhere, and of course made me think of Annie and of her grandfather, the butcher. I don't know what we're going to do with them this spring vacation, Ms. Woodmere said, when I stooped to pat one of the cats after I told her and Miss Stevenson about Annie's grandfather. We're going away, and the boy who usually takes care of them is also. I'm not as fond of cats as Annie is, but I certainly like them, and I knew I wouldn't mind being able to spend a little more time in that house. I could feed the cats, I heard myself say. Miss Stevenson and Ms. Woodmere exchanged a look. And Miss Stevenson asked how much money I'd want, and I told her whatever they gave the boy. They said a dollar fifty a day, and I said fine. Then the other kids began arriving for the meeting. It was funny being in their house and seeing them as people as well as teachers. For instance, Miss Stevenson lit a cigarette at one point, and I nearly fell off my chair. It had never occurred to me that she smoked, because of course she couldn't at school, except in the teacher's room the way seniors could in the senior lounge. Later, she told me she'd tried to quit once because it had begun to make her hoarse, which wasn't good for singing in the chorus or for coaching the debate team. But she gained so much weight and had been in such a rotten mood all the time that she decided it would be kinder to other people as well as to herself to go back to it. I'd never thought much about Ms. Stevenson's and Ms. Woodmere's living in the same house and I don't think many other people at school had either. But that afternoon, it seemed to me that they'd probably been living together for quite a long time. They seemed to own everything jointly. You didn't get the idea that the sofa belonged to one of them and the armchair to the other or anything like that. And they seemed so comfortable with each other. Not that they seemed uncomfortable at school, but at school they were rarely together except at special events like plays or dances, which they usually helped chaperone. Even then, they were usually with a whole bunch of other teachers, and Sally had always said that at dances, one or the other of them was usually whirling around the floor with one of the men teachers. But in their house, they were like a couple of old shoes, each with its own special lumps and bumps and cracks, but nonetheless a pair that fit with ease into the same shoe box. It's so nice of you two to have us here, said Mrs. Poindexter, when we were all more or less settled in the living room, and Miss Woodmere and Miss Stevenson were passing out cokes and tea and cookies. All not only included members of the student council, but also Sally and Walt as student fund drive share people, and Miss Baxter as well. Miss Baxter was taking notes, which made Mary Lou furious. Mrs. Poindexter was wearing a black dress with little bits of white lace at the throat and wrists that reminded me of Miss Baxter's handkerchiefs. Somehow it made her look as if she were about to bury someone. I will read, she said, with apologies to Sally and Walt, who have already seen it, from Mr. Piccolo's last report to me. Miss Baxter? She sailed her glasses onto her nose. Mrs. Poindexter, said Miss Stevenson, as Miss Baxter pulled a file folder out of the chunky, old-fashioned briefcase she'd brought with her, shouldn't the meeting be called to order first? Mrs. Poindexter flipped her glasses down. Oh, very well, she said crossly. The meeting. Miss Stevenson cleared her throat. Eliza, said Mrs. Poindexter smoothly, we're waiting. The meeting, I said as steadily as possible, will come to order. The chair... I couldn't help giving that word a little extra emphasis, recognizes Mrs. Poindexter. Mrs. Poindexter crashed her glasses back into her nose and pushed away the black cat, 
who had started to rub against her leg. Then he moved to Miss Baxter, who sneezed demurely but pointedly. Miss Woodmere scooped him up and took him downstairs. The overall goal, said Mrs. Poindexter sonorously, looking over the tops of her spectacles, is 150000 for rising expenses like salaries and badly needed new equipment, in the lab, for example, and 150000 for renovations. We don't actually have to have the cash by the end of the campaign, but we'd like to have pledges for that amount, with their due dates staggered so we can collect 100000 a year for the next three years. And by next fall, we'd like to have 35 new students, 20 in the lower school, 10 in the freshman class, and 5 in the sophomore class. So far, we have only four new lower school prospects and one freshman, and less than half the money has been pledged. Khan whistled. Precisely, said Mrs. Poindexter, who ordinarily did not approve of whistling. She began to read from Mr. Piccolo's report. The day of the independent school is seen by many local businessmen, financiers, and area industrialists as being over. Our fundraising consultant tells me that, college tuition being what it is, people are increasingly reluctant to spend large sums of money on pre-college schooling, even with the New York public schools being what they are. I see this as influencing both the enrollment problem and the lack of donations and creating constant resistance to our publicity campaign. There is also a feeling that independent schools can no longer shelter children from the outside world. There was mention by one or two people I spoke to recently of the unfortunate incident two years ago involving the senior girl and the boy she later married. That, most of us knew, referred to two seniors Mrs. Poindexter had tried to get expelled, first by council and then by the board of trustees, back when I was a sophomore. As Miss Stevenson, who'd argued on their side, had pointed out, their main crime was that they'd fallen in love too young. But all Mrs. Poindexter had been able to see was the scandal when the girl got pregnant. The point of view, Mrs. Poindexter went on reading, has been expressed by prospective foster donors or parents that although once upon a time parents sent their offspring to independent schools to shield them from the social problems supposedly rampant in public schools, now those problems are equally prevalent in independent schools. This kind of thinking is what our publicity campaign must now counteract. When Mrs. Poindexter stopped reading, I raised my hand and then remembered I was supposedly presiding, so I put it down. I have a friend who goes to public school, I said, feeling a little odd referring to Annie that way. And, well, I think they have more of a drug problem, for instance, than we do, and other problems too. So I wonder if those parents and people are really right about the problems being equally prevalent. But one thing, though, even though my friend's school is kind of rough, it's a lot more interesting than Foster. What I'm saying is that I wonder if some people might want to send their kids to public schools to sort of broaden them. I think maybe more people think independent schools are snobby than used to. We will get nowhere, Mrs. Poindexter said severely, if our own students do not see the value of a foster education. Eliza, I am surprised at you. It's, it's not not seeing the value of it, Mary Lou said angrily. That's not what Liza said at all. I think all she was doing was explaining what some of the people Mr. Piccolo talked to might be thinking. And I bet she's right. I used to go with a guy from public school, and he thought Foster was snobby, and that we were too sheltered. Oh, but Mary Lou, dear, Miss Baxter fluttered. Neither you nor Li Liza is very sheltered, though, really. Are you? That is, if both of you have been, er, associating with people from other schools, and as you say, you have been, and that is fine, she added hastily. Very good, in fact. She glanced anxiously at Mrs. Poindexter. We must remember, she said gently, that it takes all kinds. The good Lord made us all. I am not sure, said Mrs. Poindexter, but what this is all entirely beside the point. It is our job to sell Foster's advantages to people, not to imagine disadvantages or to dwell on the questionable influence students from outside schools may have. Questionable influence? I burst out before I could stop myself. And Mary Lou, she had worn that public school guy's ring for nearly a year, got very red. Con shook his head at her and put his hand on my arm, whispering, 
Watch it, Liza. Well, the whole meeting fell apart then. We spent a lot of time arguing instead of deciding what to do. It's just that in order to combat other people's attitudes, we have to understand them first, Con said after about half an hour more. But Mrs. Poindexter still couldn't see it as anything but unkind criticism of her beloved foster. Finally, though, we decided to have a big student rally the Friday after spring vacation, and we planned to try and urge each student either to recruit a new student or to get an adult to pledge money. Walt muttered, nickels and dimes. Mr. Piccolo says businesses and rich people and industries are the only good sources of money. But Mrs. Poindexter was so enthusiastic about what we could do if the whole foster family pulls together that somehow she managed to convince most of us we might be able to turn the campaign around. Sally and Walt said they would plan the rally, and Mrs. Poindexter said I should help them as council president. She told us we should consider ourselves a committee of three. After a lot of backing and forthing, the three of us agreed to have two meetings the next week before vacation began, and then a final one during vacation, right before school started again. Then, just as Mrs. Poindexter seemed to be ready to end the meeting, and I was trying to decide whether to call for a motion to adjourn or just wait and see if she'd go back to ignoring my being president again, Ms. Baxter raised her hand, and Mrs. Poindexter nodded at her. I would just like to remind us all, Ms. Baxter said, waggling one of her handkerchiefs as she nervously pulled it out of her sleeve, that, and of course we are all aware of it, that it is now more essential than ever that all foster students, but especially council members, conduct themselves both in private and in public in their usual exemplary fashion. We are more in the public eye than we may realize. Why, just last week I was in Tuscans. Tuscans, mind you, that enormous department store, and a sales lady asked if I taught at Foster, and said, wasn't it exciting about the campaign, and wasn't Foster a wonderful school? Miss Baxter smiled and dabbed at her nose with her handkerchief. How wonderful for us all to be able to assure foster parents and future foster parents by our own example of Foster's highly moral atmosphere. Even outsiders are beginning to see that we are indeed special. That is one of the exciting things about the campaign. What an inspiring opportunity it gives us all. Well put, Ms. Baxter, said Mrs. Poindexter, beaming at her. Ms. Baxter smiled modestly. Now we know why she had Baxter come, Mary Lou whispered to Con and me. I'm sure we would all like to show Ms. Baxter our agreement and thank her for reminding us of our duty, said Mrs. Poindexter, looking around the room. Miss Stevenson seemed to be thinking about clearing away the Coke cans. That seemed like a good idea to me, too, so I gave Mrs. Poindexter a perfunctory nod and then started to get up, reaching for the tray. But Miss Stevenson glared at me, and I realized that I was going too far. Sally said, Thank you, Miss Baxter, and started clapping, so the rest of us did, too. Thank you, said Miss Baxter, still with a modest smile. Thank you, but your best thanks will be to continue to show the world and to help your fellow students show the world also that foster students are indeed a cut above. For we, she sang suddenly, launching into the most rousing, but also the most ridiculous of our school songs, are jolly good fosters, for we are jolly good fosters. Of course we all sang along with her. It was a little sad because none of us, except Sally and at least outwardly Walt, was really very enthusiastic. And there were those two old women, whale and pilot fish, eagle and sparrow, heads back, mouths open wide, eyes shining, singing as if they were both desperately trying to be 15 years old again.